Can you mute us, Amazon? Yes, better. Can you mute us? I think you can mute yourself, sir. I can't do that. I'm trying. Go to the bottom. Yeah, Shobha, are you here? Can you mute them? Hello, Shobha. Okay. So thank you, everybody. So dear veterinarians, students, and farmers, Assalamu alaikum and good evening. Welcome everyone to today's discussion on effective and responsible use of antibiotics in dairy production, organized by Ada Health Bangladesh. I am Dr. Mijan. We will be with you to facilitate this discussion. Our today's speaker is Dr. Hakan Landin from Sweden. He is a good friend of us and visited Sibaso in 2018 and we always have a very good communication with him. Dr. Hakan is a veterinarian and obtained his MS in veterinary medicine from Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, Sweden. He has a specialization in cattle diseases. He has experiences to work both in public and private veterinary services in Sweden. He has been working as consultant, other health expert, advisor, project leader in different organizations since 1999. Currently, he is in charge of senior advisor in district veterinarians, Board of Agriculture, Sweden, and he is mainly focused on heart health with the daily practitioners. He has oid experiences in communicating research results with the policymakers, veterinarians, and farmers. He writes in popular science magazine for field veterinarians and farmers. He is also involved in teaching veterinarians, farmers, advisors in Nordic countries and also in Bangladesh through organizing seminars and courses. Hakans has also expertise in preparing guidelines for veterinary services. We have also several other distinguished colleagues here who will be working as a panelist to contribute in the discussion. Among them, there is Professor Abdul Samad. He is the ex-dean and director, Maharashtra Animal and Fishery Animal Sciences and Fishery Sciences University, and also co-founder, veteran, and a dairy consultant in India. We have among us Professor Nitish Chandra Devnath. He is the ex-vice chancellor of Chittagong Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, and kind of working as a team leader. Fleming Fund Project, Bangladesh, and on health high level expert panel on genetic diseases. We have also with us Professor Dr. Mohammad Saidur Rahman, the Chairman of the Department of Pharmacology, Bangabandhu, Sheikh Muslim Medical University. Also, he is a popular speaker and he is well known to create awareness among common people about the current pandemic, COVID pandemic going on. We have also another colleague. Dr. Rozahin Mansour from University of Putra, Malaysia. He also visited Bangladesh in 2016 and he is also working on the mass studies and heart health, etc. We have also another colleague, Dr. Shahinur Alam. He is a popular field practitioner in northern part of Bangladesh. Recently, he has been appointed as Deputy Director, Animal Health Department of Livestock Services, Bangladesh. So thank you very much. And uh, I finished my introduction. So Hakan, now it is your time. You can uh, start uh, sharing your slides now. Hakan. Th thank you, Michan. And thank you for the very nice presentation. And I'm really happy to be able to join this uh, webinar with you. Uh, I'm honored about the question of trying to do well for me. Um, as you heard, I have a lot of experiences with milking herds in Sweden and really health work. i just give you some facts about Sweden if you don't know them. And then I will uh, try to address to you my vision of a new veterinary mission that is a little bit a part of treating sick animals. 
We have a short break, a technical break, and maybe grasp a cup of tea or coffee. And then we go into the main topic about this uh, webinar, antibiotic responsibility. I mean, to be uh, long, uh, uh, sorry, uh, to fix it over the years. I will have some more little deep slides about selective dry cow treatment, where you use uh, antibiotics in the dried off udder. And I end up with presenting the other health pyramids which I have constructed in Sweden, which are available available on the internet for you and, and many others in nine or 10 languages, which one is English and Russia is another and Lithuania, but I guess English will do for you. That's about my program today. And feel free to pose a question or ask something that you don't understand. And then more uh, deep going questions will take them at some shortcuts. About Sweden, 2020. We have about 3,100 herds with milk production and about 300,000 cows. There have been a little bit more cows the last years. Uh, they were diminishing and I, we were a bit anxious they would go under 300,000. And in fact, we had a lot of more cows 50 years ago, but, but instead they, they produce the same amount of milk since they milk a little bit, a much more better. The herd size is around 100 cows closing up and 80% uh, of the cows are in free stalls and 20% uh, still in tie stalls. The ECM production is a slightly uh, under 11 tons per year. And uh, is, uh, we had some trouble with the, with the 2018 summer where the food production for feeding production was very uh, bad because of the dry climate, but now it's, rising again. 70% of the cows in Sweden in milk production are in animal recording. So we have a lot of information uh, regarding uh, scientific studies and uh, also see how it goes. The crossbreds are, are not common. Uh, there are mainly two breeds in Sweden, the Swedish red and the American Holstein, as you know, but it's also Swedish Holstein. But a lot, of, a lot of them are, in fact, American Holstein. Some small parts of the, of the uh, cow crowd are, in fact, a little bit smaller Swedish Jersey and Swedish Pold, which is uh, in the mountainsides in Sweden. There's still some small herds with the Swedish Pold. Maybe you heard about it. We have a lot of automatic milking systems. Um, De Laval is, in fact, a Swedish company, as you know. So I've been a lot of times at Hamra, the, the herd uh, where they do their um, um, new types of milking parlors. I would say that 40% of the Swedish cows uh, live, in fact, on a robot farm today. And the largest farm with robots uh, has a thousand cows and 18 robots. So, uh, but normally the typical robot farm, uh, AMS farm in Sweden, has about uh, two robots and 120, 140 cows. We have discussed a lot uh, during the years in Sweden uh, what is really happening with the veterinary tasks in the new herds. And uh, we have made some uh, uh, statements that there's a new role for the veterinarians. And we also started some programs to secure the animal health and welfare in these farms with many employees and advanced technical level, uh, such as robot milking. And the aim, the goal for this uh, new veterinary role uh, program was to contribute to economic growth and consumers' trust, which is important for milk production uh, in Sweden as a country. Um, some, some people think that the cows are 
don't live well in their farms, but I think they haven't ever been to a farm. Most Swedes haven't seen a milking cow during their whole life. So we must uh, try to communicate how good it is for many cows in Swedish farms. I met maybe some of you uh, in 2018, and then I showed this uh, little animation, uh, which supports my ideas of what you should do as a veterinarian or a health worker uh, in uh, milk production. You could say that the cows in a herd uh, is somewhere between uh, between a line uh, on on a line between totally healthy and totally sick, and in fact. Uh, they are even totally sick uh, and they might die of that. Uh, but the pile of cows is uh, largest in the middle. It's like a Gauss uh, curve, really. But normally, the farmer and you as a veterinarian, you might not see the clinical signs for subclinical uh, uh, sickness. So the traditional veterinary efforts are made in this little uh, triangle here, which is, uh, of course, uh, evident, and maybe in, uh, you must do it and save the life's animal uh, so it won't die and, or you lose a lot of money. But there's a problem with that, and if you look at the economic uh, gain from cows uh, between totally healthy and totally sick, you really earn most, most money if they are totally healthy and you start to lose money uh, if you see the baseline is uh, you lose money for a lot of cows here uh, between the middle the median and the limit for cl clinical science so the efforts for veterinarians and farmers of course should be to move this pile of cows more to the left so no one gets a clinical sign of really evident sickness. Then you would earn a lot of money and the cows would be happier and it's health work that really pays off. Just to make an explanation, uh, what are the cows doing for us? The daily activity, many cows in Sweden, they really produces 50 kilos a day. And that would mean, uh, for example, four kilos of sugar delivered to the other every day. The calcium in the blood uh, would, must be replaced more than 20 times during the one 24-hour time relapse. And they must drink a lot of water. Uh, I mean, water is, uh, you must have it both for producing milk and to uh, uh, live well as a cow, uh, so 150 liters of water drunken, and they also must heat it sometimes so it doesn't uh, cool them off. This energy metabolism that, that, that you really uh, takes place in a cow responds to two, as you yourself as a man would run two marathons every day. Also, is there something like the blood must pass the other, 25,000 liters of blood passing the other every day uh, in, in the lactation period. So there's a lot of going on. And that gives us some uh, clue that you shouldn't stand up, because if you stand up and is a cow, the blood flow is 3.7 liters per minute. And if you lie down, it's about 4.6 liters blood per minute that passes the other, where this uh, metabolism can take place. So a nice dry and clean bed uh, is very important for a high yielding cow. I will go further on just uh, making a remark that might interest some of you and some of the farmers that might listen. What is the somatic cell count? I work a lot with other health and this is my marker for other health. Uh, you get some uh, cell cells in the in the milk, and 89%, 80 to 90 percent of these cells are in fact white blood cells. They are a defense against bacteria, 
that protrudes into the other every time you milk them, or maybe between the milkings as well. They are not bad, uh, even if a high cell count says something's bad in the other, they are not bad themselves uh, because they are just the defense against bacteria. So they tell us something bad has happened. A true signal for other infection. Uh, you can use it uh, monitoring what's happening subclinically uh, regarding the other health in a herd. So why do I talk uh, so much about uh, somatic cell count? Why, it, why is it important uh, otherwise than scientifically? It's important for the farmer because when the other is slightly inflammated, it will produce lesser milk than if it's uh, totally healthy. This is an interesting study done in Sweden by Kristel Hagnestam Nielsen some years ago. Uh, she took uh, and analyzed uh, a lot of uh, yeed loss for subclinical mastitis on nearly 30,000 test days and nearly 500 cows. Most of them were Swedish red, but also many, 40% nearly was Holstein. And you can see this uh, interesting uh, graph uh, that if a first cover, which is the blue line here, if it has 250,000 in cell count, it will lose one kilo uh, milk per day. And if you look at an older cow, which is the red line, uh, it lies around 300,000 in cell count, it's, it will lose. Uh, two kilos a day. So there's a loss of milk, even though you don't see any clinical sign of mastitis on these cows. There were no mastitis cases in this study. They were, they were taken away, so there's only subclinical mastitis, cell, cell cows, as you call them in Sweden. And you can also calculate this. What does this really mean? It means the loss of $1 per thousand in elevated cell count per cow year. So if you lose hundred, if you lie hundred thousand above uh, the target, which would be hundred fifty thousand uh, in the bulk, you lose about eight hundred Swedish crowns, uh, which is in fact eighty dollars per cow and year. I think it's important to monitor other health status and the cell uh, count is uh, um, so far the best uh, marker for that. We have tried different uh, other items, uh, uh, both Nagasa and uh, lactate rehydrogenase, but still the cell count is the most uh, safe. We know what it means and it's easy to measure. The best choice is, of course, not to use uh, this handheld uh, cell counter, which is a De Laval uh, uh, thing they sell, uh, but to be uh, within a dairy herd improvement program where you monthly test uh, the cow cell count in, in the milk on other level. So, what is my opinion, or what is your opinion? What, which cell count uh, reflects a totally healthy cow? You might have some discussion about this, but I can see the Swedish cows, if you plot them, all of them, on this line, uh, the red is the red cows and the black is the black cows in Sweden. You can see that the type value, most cows, slightly above, 13% of the red cows, they lie around 25,000 cells per milliliter of milk. And these cows are the most uh, healthy ones, and they stay healthy the longest. As a veterinarian, you might uh, work with cows that are far beyond to the right in, in this graph. Uh, I mean, you have 200,000 here, 100,000 here. So, but the typical bunch of cows are really healthy. In Sweden, if you take 150,000 cells per milliliter as, as a 
limit for healthy, not healthy, uh, 70% uh, of Swedish cows are under this uh, limit. Little bit slightly, the median is slightly higher for SLB, SLB than SRB, but still, um, there is no big difference. And you mustn't believe that you can get cows that are, let's say, one million or two to get totally healthy again. But on the other hand, the cows that are typical ones, between 20 and 40,000 cells per milliliter, they are healthy during the longest time. They normally don't get an episode of high cell counts and or mastitis. So of course, there are some levels in what you do as a veterinary worker in, in uh, milk production. The typical is the clinical events. The farmer gets in contact with you and he wants, he or she wants you to come to him and, uh, and mend the cow. But also we've, we've done a lot of um, uh, new services where you monitor risk animals. You look at cows after calving, you look at cows at drying off, maybe you, you look at cows at, uh, for pregnancy work, uh, fertility work, uh, check them in the uterus or so. But there is also a, a strategic level where you go in and make some changes to get a better result. The classic veterinary efforts in dairy production is unexpected. An animal gets sick and the veterinary goes there and try to mend it. But the livestock ag agencies normally have herd services wh where they schedule scheduled visits and monitor risk animals and monitor the fertility. And some people at the livestock ag agencies and also at the strict veterinarian, which is uh, normal general practitioners, some of them do this strategic work and try to be a part of the discussion. What should we change and sh how should we go further in this uh, uh, herd, in this stable, in this stall maybe. What can we do for, for getting a better uh, result? And me, myself, I've done this for the last 20 years, uh, almost merely this, uh, but still I have some contact with many colleagues that do all these uh, levels in different herds or at different occasions. You could say it's hard to be strategic when it's very acute. Then you must do it, save the life first, mend it as quick as possible and come back or maybe take a pause and do it afterwards because you must be a bit more uh, listening when you do the strategic work and you must be more cool. So this is about my vision. I think there is a new veterinary mission that we should move to as veterinarians in, in Sweden and I guess in the world who, who deals with uh, the veterinarians who deals with livestock rearing and produ production. You should move from drug delivery to health work. Drug delivery is in fact uh, a bit of uh, a shortcut to nothing. Uh, you must use the nature, the, the, the sustainability within the cow to get it uh, to deliver a healthy cow for a long time. We've done like this in Sweden for 30 years. We talked about this. And the last years, we're starting to really move on in the right direction. This is the mastitis incidence uh, in Sweden as a whole. And you can see it, it is, uh, it has, it just go down, goes down. They become healthier and healthier, less acute mastitis 
for every year. And since we have less acute mastitis, mastitis stands for the largest part of antibiotic consumption in most countries. But since we have less mastitis and less uh, antibiotic consuming dis uh, diseases, Sweden is uh, using very little antibiotics. And you can see Sweden, uh, sorry, uh, that's not Sweden, that's Slovenia. Sweden is here. Sorry, can you see that? Oh, uh, Sweden, there, sorry about that. It's only Norway and Finland uh, who are lower than Sweden. Finland is a little bit higher, really. So only Norway is better than Sweden. In if you if you're aiming at a low consumption of uh, antibiotics, and I once got a question. I was in Holland and lecturing about antibiotics, and and they asked me how we what we used in. Uh, in Sweden, uh, concerning uh, regarding antibiotics, and you can see the names to the right here. Chinolones, pleuro, yeah, on so right there. Uh, and I told them we use ninety percent penicillin, penicillin G, and the other ten percent is little bit tetracyclines and and some others, and almost no fluoroquinolones today. And they asked me, how is that possible? Isn't it allowed? Well, I can tell you, it is allowed to use almost every substance in Sweden, but we have agreed uh, together not to use them. So uh, the guidelines are very sharp and they are accepted by all veterinarians. Almost all. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we try to discuss with our colleagues that use a lot of um, resistance um, producing substances. So what do you prefer? Uh, as a farmer or as a veterinarian? You mustn't prefer just one thing, but you must, I think, try to do all these levels. Clinical treatments on demand, of course, uh, you must have some to to uh, reach on the phone if something is going bad or, or it's in hypercalcemia, for example, a paresis, and, and you must maybe do some documentation uh, with her service during the transition period for other health and fertility, that's good. But it's very good if you also try to reach the level of strategic planning and the health work. I mean, adapting the system and your doings to the cow needs, the cow's need. I mean, just don't mend and monitor, also manage, help with the management as a veterinarian or an advisor. That will be uh, very interesting and it's a bit uh, difficult though, but it's very promising and, and it's very, uh, you, you become very happy when you succeed. And that is why also the economy Per worked hour is highest if you do the health work and do a strategic uh, change that produces a higher amount of health, a higher level of health in the herd. So I have a, a gel in the night if, if I would try to tell you what I like to do the most in my veterinary life. Uh, I will try to help the farmer help help the herds to keep the healthy cows still healthy. That is the best thing to do. And it's very funny as well. I mean, you, you get happy when you have only healthy cows. I make a short break here and uh, thank you for listening and welcome uh, with questions and remarks and maybe something um, that don't agree with me, please.
I must say, do, do you hear me, Michan? <coughs> yes, uh, I think we can hear you very well. And uh, Michan, is it that we can talk yes, something sir. now? Yes, sir, it is possible, sir. Please go on. Yes. Uh, Professor, thank you very much. It is a very impressive uh, presentation. And I am so much of uh, fond of this sort of approach, you know, uh, with my colleagues in Chittagong and also my colleagues, those who are working in the field. I do sometimes talk to them that target the dairy, you know, hard as a hard health service and not a veterinarian to give only the clinical service. My question to you, do you use the IT technology for managing all these farm records? And do you have any particular uh, program so that you can, you know, in Bangladesh, we are quite advanced in keeping record, you know, in using IT facility. Oh. But it has not very much reflected in the veterinary field or in the field of animal health. Uh, as a person, I am very interested to use uh, that technology for maintaining all these records and making forecast and then finally making decision. What is your comment about that thing? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting question. Yes, I use IT and documentation, uh, technical documentation a lot. In fact, I seldom go to a farm very often. I go there once and we have a, I mean, a planning discussion. And then I follow up with the teams uh, team sessions where where I look at their figures because they are they are coming in all of the time and I see things they don't are aware of so I can help I can help them much better and in fact uh, you must know the person you're working with uh, and he or she knows the cows a little bit better than you do on distance but you can see a lot of with the distance as a consultant you shouldn't be too much responsible for what you do with the animals. You could then see what is really lacking here. And uh, if you have a good relation uh, with the herd, they like this. They want to hear what you see. And we have, uh, in fact, some uh, really interesting uh, IT tools, which, uh, on, which is called the Signals for Welfare which many farms look at every month. How how am I doing with the welfare? We have 25 welfare markets that are logged in the system, in the DHI system in Sweden. So, uh, and you you can manage without it, but it's really, it it is making it all much easier and much more evident, I guess. Because the cows, you must mirror the cows in a proper way, and we have lots of um, possibilities in Sweden. And and I would say it starts with yield and cell count and fertility figures, but you can all also look at much of uh, much of the data for um, recorded sickness is all also in there, of course. So uh, yeah, I, I think. Uh, I think we will go to uh, the future this year with the Corona. I, I have been on very few farm visits because then you meet maybe 10 people uh, on a place where you don't live. You shouldn't do that because of the uh, spreading of the Corona virus. So, so we've met via, via the computer a lot. And I think it has been um, uh, very successful because it's very easy to get the time then it's hard to get time with it with a large herd in sweden uh, to to get the people to be at some place sometime just a special day if, if something is happening or they are free of, of, of labor but when you use the technical possibilities it's easy 
and they are they are very high tech the farms in Sweden uh, I guess um, more high tech than the normal Swede uh, the farms are all computerized uh, especially the robot farms of course sorry that was a long answer but uh, I think that is the future. No, no, no. I think uh, you have a very uh, nice answer for that. Uh, but what I will advocate in this particular time of Bangladesh, you know, you might be aware that Bangladesh is basically passing through a transition uh, for yeah. dairy production. You know, the if you compare the dairy production just 10 years ago, uh, the number of dairy animals, particularly in every organized dairy farm, they are much lower. But over the last one or two decades, uh, it has grown very well and it is taking a very organized farming system. But what is lacking, and I think uh, this is the time, you know, our farmers as well as our professional colleagues listen to you. A new vision must be set up that less on a tech, you know, clinical, more on a promoting health in a more yeah. organized farm with a sort of hard health approach. That will bring a lot of economic benefit at the same time, as you correctly mentioned, a healthy animals and you keep them healthy. And I think this is the right time uh, to talk to them. And this is the right time to set that goal as a national goal as well as a professional goal. Thank you very much. I think I talk quite a lot, but it is a very timely discussion. Over. Uh, thank, thank you, you for. Uh, Hakan, I have a question to you. Yeah. In, in Sweden, in, in Sweden, in dairy, do you use a septic zone for treating dairy cows? Septic zone. Sorry, what did you say? Septic zone. It is an antibiotic. You see, uh, you see on the on the on the screen there is a question from a person. What did you say? S self. S it, it should be septraxon. I think there is some uh, spelling mistake. This is a misspelling. spelling. Yeah, but but, but he has, understand? He that he, you know, in Sweden they use penicillin G. Uh, you know, ninety percent. Ninety percent. Yeah. Yes, uh, not other antibiotics. Not other antibiotics. So we 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 very uh, we we much we don't like to use broad acting antibiotics at all. That is the um, in Sweden because we have had so lots of resistance in in the fifty years ago with that use. So we have a a guideline that you shouldn't use uh, n almost never other things than penicillin G because we have the the slowest resistance uh, growth if you use that drug it's the best one so but of course there is some sulfonamides some tetracyclines and a little bit of trimetoprim but but that is not it's just for have something to to put in the cow it hasn't it, it doesn't uh, protrude to the other so it's uh, really useless but uh, some veterinarians like to do something with a needle. Otherwise, they haven't been there, they think. But, uh, but we're coming to, we don't use uh, lots of drugs, no. And, and our uh, total consumption of antibiotics is extremely low uh, regarding the high producing uh, uh, level. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I, I want to I want to draw the attention of Professor Saidur Rahman sir. Sir, in dairy in Bangladesh, we are sometimes using the septic zone because we don't know some, I don't know whether it's so much ethical to use septic zone dairy animal. So what is your uh, comments on using septic zone and how did the health effects in human? I I I know what now now I understood what you said. Uh, yet it's the thir third generation yes. of um, uh, penicillin. Cephaloxine. Cephaloxine, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, cephal cephaloxine, yeah. But we, we have really tried to work away from that in cattle in Sweden and we succeeded. We don't need it. Uh, 
we don't use it uh, so uh, it is it is uh, allowed but it's not used okay thank you uh, thank you very much okay. uh, so, so we, we have uh, dry cow treatments with, with only penicillin okay thank you so Saidu Raman sir please can you comment on that it's already thank you very much for asking me actually uh, uh, as you already understood that is uh, now uh, the world health organization is recommending a different principle and according to that principle exception is even for human it is a reserve drug, so it should not be used in animal at all actually uh, what he, uh, he, uh, what he, uh, yeah that should be should not be used at all because we, uh, all of us know about this the ecosystem and what, what, whatever the condition is whenever you are using antibiotic whether it is in human health or in animal health or in environment all are leading to the same detection and resulting into resistance so ceftriaxon should not be used in animal unless there is a clear indication to save the life that is the only condition where if we want to save life and you have a clear evidence that no other alternative you have you can use otherwise it should not be used should be reserved for even it is a reserved drug for human as well we we had this discussion in sweden because we had a preparation widely used on claw health just some years ago but we we made the discussion with the farmers and said this antibiotic would be reserved for humans that might die and we cannot use it in animals because of the danger of spreading the resistance genes for for, for this uh, drug so and, and they accepted that so uh, for three or four years just uh, without legislation they they stopped using it via their veterinarians of course because uh, they must do the decision i don't like to use that because but they explain why because there were already uh, child children in sweden that died of resistant uh, uh, bacterial infections so that was true they have to do something and and they accepted it the farmers and they did other things to get rid of the uh, the problems okay thank you thank you very much thank you very much so if anybody want to ask anything i have a I was thinking of a time to relax and get some tea or coffee and maybe a technical pause for some of you. Say five minutes from now. Is it okay? Yes, yes, okay. You can, you can come back again within five okay. minutes. Five minutes. Okay. So I think, yes, sir, we can, we can continue. You can continue the discussion here. I think we will come back within five minutes. Actually, actually, you know. <clears throat> I, I, I'd like to you know, say, say a few uh, words you know, about herd health program, which we have been doing here in India. Uh, in my opinion, uh, for implementing such a program, the basic requirement is uh, uh, that you know the health services are to be privatized. If it is in government, all government services, I mean, you know, this is true for India. I'm talking about, you know, Indian, in Indian scenario. That, you know, the, the main focus is on establishment of hospitals, polyclinic, dispensaries. And therefore, the mindset is that you have to, you have to treat. And therefore, the entire focus is detecting sick animal and then treatment. Another problem we face here in India is that farmers are ready to pay for treatment and not ready to pay for herd health. I had a very bad experience uh, with you know, a few organized farms. We implemented a program for two years. We, we brought down the, uh, you know, the treatment, uh, you know, the drug usage and, you know, several other factors. And then after two years, the farmer said, when, well, now that my animals are not falling, why do I need to, you know, pay you unnecessarily? And therefore, uh, you know, this has to uh, start from both the end. The, I think slowly, uh, you know, I, I, I have been you know, working with our government, you know, state government, etc. And I have been telling them that wherever private practice is sustainable, possible economically, the government should withdraw from it. 
and then you know you have a continuity because as uh, he has pointed out rightly that you need continuity and person knowing the farmer and farmer knowing the vet is important but if the vet is transferred every three years or five years you know that continuity is lost and then the infrastructure development for you know doing all these kind of activities if it is a private practice then he will invest in his in that and then second is you know strong legal uh, framework well in sweden he said that you know the conscious level of the you know vets is very high so they are self regulating which may not be you know possible in our, in in our system so you know you've got to have a very strong uh, regulatory framework for the vets if you want to you know switch them over to you know, herd health i've been you know fighting about animal data recording since last 10 years and i think that is the least probability with the government only recently you know they have started uh, you know some recording program but that is again restricted to only you know purchase of tag and tagging i mean nobody is you know updating the record and if you do not have records and the dynamic records which are in uh, real time you can you know it's difficult to you know sit at home and you know provide these services because when you sit at home you know you get into database and find out you know what is the issue but if you do not have recording system so this is impossible so there are few core requirements and once we have met those requirements then only we can switch okay thank you very much sir thank you very much how can are you ready to go again yes i'm ready okay please go ahead uh, welcome back uh, for me and uh, maybe some of you went to the loo or something. Uh, let's sit down together. As you can see, you can really cope with uh, different breeds. Uh, poodles, Hofavart and German Shepherd. Now I come to the topic of how to use antibiotics effectively and responsibly in dairy production. As you might understand, my solution is to do a good health work, then you don't need to mend it with antibiotics. Important to know, if you get resistance, you cannot use antibiotic. And that could threaten millions of human lives and the health, welfare and productivity of your livestock. They also saw it, it, the resistance is driven by the use of antibiotics and disease prevention. I mean, good animal husbandry, biosecurity and vaccination. This will uh, make you not dependable on the antibiotic parachute. So to say, the antibiotic resistance is created by the use. Here you can see some um, view of small dots that you figure is our bacteria. And one of them uh, is in fact resistant. Nothing is happening in this uh, occasion because there's only one resistant bacteria in this bunch of bacteria. But then you use uh, antibiotics on it and what's happening is that this bacteria will become more abundant. So, the, the word we should really yell out is, the more we use them, the more we lose them. And in fact, not only the bacteria that causes the disease will get resistant. Also, other bacteria that causes other diseases could be resistant. So, you share the resistance with other bacteria, with other diseases, and you can, so to say, be contagious with the resistance. The bacteria also passes it between them. So it's really a threat to the humans in the whole world now. So uh, beware. The, worst, the first thing to do is to be restrictive use of antibiotics. And don't use antibiotics uh, in the feed. Use it individually, and why not with the searing, but uh, do it. 
in milk production, I guess, in Sweden and in many other countries, there are three different uh, diseases, disease bunches, uh, disease crowds that you use antib a lot of antibiotics on. And it's for claws, calves, and milking cows. And on claws, it's panarrhythmia and digital dermatitis. For calves, it's pneumonia and diarrhea. And for cows, it's clinical and subclinical mastitis. And in Sweden, clinical and subclinical mastitis stands for 70% of all the antibiotic consumed in the country. I don't know how it is in Bangla or in India or in Malaysia, but I guess it's something similar. A safe building, uh, not dependent on careless antibiotic use, would include good animal husbandry, biosecurity and vaccination. But we shall look on the, on the different items. The maybe most important preventive activity on claws is to have a regular trimming and inspecting. It isn't for sure that you must really trim the claw, but you must inspect it. Then you discover uh, disease and uh, you get the claw to be healthier since it's more uh, adaptable to the surfaces it's walking on. For the calves, it's even easier because it starts at birth. You should but just focus on the colostrum. And since the th last 30 years, I've been trying to motivate my farmers to do a good colostrum um, routine. And still, it doesn't always work. So here is just some um, benchmarking. Be there when the calves come to the word. You give it colostrum as soon as possible, and that last time is six hours after calving. And give it at least two to four liters as soon as possible. Most calves would requi require three and a half to four liters if they can um, take it in their stomach. It's very good. Um, and don't give it cold and don't store it at room temperature, store it in the fridge and uh, take it take it out and uh, heat it up slightly. The most important preventive activity for the calf health. health. Oh, my favorite uh, is the mastitis complex. You can see this, uh, there are lots of things here. And I was happy that one of you just mentioned one of the most important things. I mean, mastitis, milk production starts uh, with milking. That, I think, is the most important preventive activity that you should really get in place on the farms. You can find this in the leaflet. I also think uh, Michan has uh, sent you. Um, it's nothing new. Uh, much of the milking uh, of a cow uh, depends on her letdown. The stimulation, the nerve impulses, the oxytocin in the blood and the milk letdown. And uh, touch the other and the teats wait for the oxytocin to go back to the other and uh, empty the alveoli into the system of the other and the teeth. Then it will be very good. It takes uh, 30 to 40 seconds. And we struggle really with the robot, for, uh, robot producers not to be too quick. Uh, to attach uh, the, the teat cups because the machine can be quite quick to stimulate the cow. Must They must wait. So 50 to 60 seconds is a good time to reach and um, do that. It will go faster and be less, uh, be less um, 
harming to, to the other. I guess many know this, but they don't really live after it. So. One interesting thing with oxytocin in the blood is it it's one of the few hormones or signals, uh, signal polypeptides that have a positive feedback. If you get a high oxytocin uh, the, the time before your milk, it will be higher the next time if you continue to do a good stimulation. So it, it really is a positive feedback. So do it probably every time and you will get a, about 10% more milk if you are a good stimulator than if you are a bad. Other things to remember is the four parts to, to, for the bacteria to go into the other. Right teeth, right hind teeth, right left hind teeth and left fore teeth. I mean, um, there is something. Dry, clean and closed teeth channels protect against mastitis and cell counts. So don't do that bad. Be very careful about the teeth ends and the handling of the teeth before you milk them. There's a lot of defense in the teeth channel. Humoral factors, leukocytes, I mean that cell count, as we talked about, and also physical factors. The keratin, the ring muscle, the teeth skin, and the milk flow. The milk flow is in fact very good for washing out uh, the microorganism that, that uh, attacks uh, the teeth channel. I think these, uh, these about eight to nine millimeters on every teat. So I think those millimeters are the most important on a milking cow to keep healthy and uh, clean and dry between milkings. I also have um, shown this for, to some of you uh, the last time I was in Bangla. But choosing the right uh, preventive actions, uh, then you must, you should try to get knowledge about which bacteria is uh, acting in in the in the crowd, in in the yard, because different other bacteria has different transmission, and there's a cow reservoir or an environmental reservoir, and you can see this like two triangles where some bacteria are more uh, contagious, uh, they live in another cow and moves uh, to next cow, or they are around the cow in the environment, and they move into the other between the milkings. But the trans transmission of these other bacteria are in two ways. And uh, if you know some names of the other bacteria, you can see the contagious ones to the left, strep ag, mycoplasma bovis, stephorus, and strep dysgalactia, typical uh, contagious bacteria, and the CNS uh, or KNS, it says here, it's a bit of both. Um, it can be other, other, other strains are more environmental and some of them. There are about 10 different strains of CNS in Sweden, which we type in the Malditoff uh, system. Strep is a uh, typical environmental mastitis bacteria in Sweden, although it creates uh, chronic cases. Its, uh, its reservoir is uh, in the stable, in the straw, in the surroundings. Pyogenes, Klebsiella, and E. coli, a typical uh, environmental bacteria. The risk factors are different then. For contagious mastitis, it's milking and biosecurity. And for environmental bacteria, it's hygiene and immunity. I mean, the cow 
must be immune enough to withstand uh, those bacteria. Okay, I'll come back to the bacteria type uh, a little bit later. Milking herd in crisis. If you don't know, you have no really, you have not really met the farm, you haven't been there, you haven't seen the figures or anything, you must help them if they have big troubles with mastitis or, or the milk quality. Then you can do these uh, five action areas. You don't know which bacteria, you haven't done any culturing. Start with that. Uh, and calchronics, which are, you won't, they won't heal, take them away. And focus on properly preparing of the other before milking. And if you don't do it, see to the teeth dipping. And don't send milk with clots to the dairy farm. Then you might have done some culturing, then you can move forward to the action areas, which are more diverse towards the system's problems. If you have contagious bacteria, Focus on tea tipping, biosecurity at calving, milking routines, milk machine function, milking order, and milking hygiene. And also be careful that cows really don't lie down directly after milking when the tea channel is open for 30 to 40 minutes. But if you have the other way around, you have environmental mastitis bacteria in the culturing, go for hygiene, milking hygiene. Lying hygiene, water hygiene, feeding hygiene, minerals and vitamins, low stress handling, and biosecurity at calving. I mean, the two last are, are not so much uh, uh, typical for environmental, but they are really to protect the cow. If you then done these, uh, first action areas on respect, uh, respective herd, you can go further on with the, the more uh, the forthcoming. And they are a bit similar, but in different uh, order, depending on what bacterial load you have on, on the farm. You can see there, this, you get the feeding balance, the dry cow routines, the, the milking routines as well, as you've seen them before uh, in contagious mastitis uh, yards. Alter in the proper way, it will give you the result faster. Oops. You should, of course, act like this. Uh, a farmer shouldn't just treat a cow without consulting a veterinarian and treat it with whatever. The best thing is to consult a veterinarian and adapt individual therapy for the sick animal. And I'm not sure that you can use penicillin as much as in Sweden, but I think it might be more uh, effective than you think and it's you should know that it's really not uh, provoking resistance so it's the best drug to use okay i make a short stop there michan uh, are there any questions or remarks so far Hello? Yes.
me? Uh, there Hello. Yes. 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 If you want to ask any question, please go on. My question is whether you have a sort of guideline uh, for the veterinarian to use antibiotics and other measures for mastitis as a whole, rather than, you know, case by case. I mean, a sort of uh, guideline for using what sort of antibiotic and uh, which uh, organism should be treated against which uh, antibiotic. This sort of guideline do you have? And uh, or uh, it can be developed in a national level uh, with some sort of based on some evidence. That is my question. Over to you. Uh, we have evidence and uh, we have documented that when we moved from broad spectrum antibiotics to narrow spectrum, the resistance dived down to 2% for Staphorus in penicillin-resistant uh, penicillin resistant strains. So, and we've done that for 30 years. Uh, we started then to, to be more restrictive and now we have, as I told you, reached 90% penicillin G and no antibiotics for coli mastitis, just uh, um, NSA, NSAID and uh, fluid therapy and milkings. Uh, we'd had some, uh, I, me myself, did a, a clinical study uh, where we had uh, randomized uh, w with the placebo on, on coli mastitis and more of the cows that got antibiotics died than those who didn't get antibiotics. So, th because that was the worst uh, thing to uh, put to the veterinarians, they were afraid that they missed a coli infection and they liked to do, uh, use something that had some effect on, on the bacteria in the coli mastitis. But we showed that it was the other way around. Uh, if you, you if you give them tender love and care and maybe fluid therapy and NS, uh, NS inside, you will get a better result. So the only the only time we use antibiotics uh, is on Klebsiella mastitis cases, but they are rare and they are not they normally don't get um, totally healed afterwards anyway. Yeah, so, but, uh, but, but but I think it's a way to go. Uh, yeah. I think it takes some time. It, we also had a lot of tetracyclines on uh, on the uterus uh, fluid flu on the metritis. Uh, but we did some uh, investigations, and and we it showed that you could use penicillin G as well there. So so therefore it in the guidelines it says use do not use tetracycline use but you could uh, cephaloxine you could use as well but we didn't want it there so uh, it, it is uh, sort of um, um, politically banned but not it's not forbidden but it it is not used so because the veterinarians are uh, have agreed upon that and some areas of Sweden have some trouble, but we have made several investigations and we haven't discovered uh, these days any uh, resistance in, in the strains. It's, they are normally uh, uh, sensitive to penicillin. If, if, you, if you do it quick, you must... Um, but I have some argument with my British uh, colleagues about... Uh, that it would uh, uh, would be a hazard to cow welfare if you couldn't use uh, cephaloxine on, on these uh, cows, but I, I'm not sure it's right. Maybe it's right in Britain, but but not in Sweden. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. It, you did very well, but. You know, uh, I don't know for my colleagues in Bangladesh where to start because it has no, uh, you know, organized approach yet uh, so far. They are really uh, uh, using their own 
knowledge and experience and not an evidence based. So I don't know. I mean, at this stage, where to start uh, for Bangladesh uh, with the present farming system condition? I think uh, you have answered my question. Thank you. Uh, I, I, re I, I, had, I had an idea I could do a clinical study in, in Britain, uh, but uh, it is hard to to, to get the ethic uh, allowance uh, there. So otherwise, I would I should have tried it because I think it would work as well as in Sweden there. But, but uh, I'm not sure because I haven't seen it. It's different populations, so I cannot be sure of what, what's happening in, in Bangla either, of course. But in Sweden, it has went Go, gone uh, went very well okay thank you hakan uh, there is one comment the main problem of antibiotic resistance is because of parabates they use it irrationally without the advice of the doctors so i want to comment on this from niti so i think he's gonna out yes. sorry you, you have to take that once again i didn't understand the question it is not for you, Hakan. The question is not for you. Yeah, it is for Nitish, sir. sir. sir can yeah, you what is the question? The... Say it again. Uh, it is on the screen, sir. What the screen is it? Is the main Effective. problem. Yeah? No, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. I cannot read you. Go ahead. Professor the main problem. Yes. The so main problem please. of antibiotic resistance is because of parabates. They use it irrationally without advice of the doctors. Yeah, you are right. There is no parabate in Bangladesh. <laughs> you know, all these are basically a sort of short-term training program. They are not well recognized parabates in Bangladesh. So this is number one. Number two, uh, the use of quark or a sort of, uh, you know, so-called uh, youth definition of parabet, they are using abusing antibiotic at a farm level. And that is why uh, or I would ask that a strong advocacy is required uh, from the veterinary profession as such that dairy farming with the view of hard health program or a sort of uh, you know less use of antibiotic and the guideline that has been provided by today's speaker should be followed to reduce the burden of antibiotic at farm level. And otherwise it will continue because all veterinarians cannot reach out the farms. Their number are limited. They are stationed at particular area, whereas number of paravet or so-called quark are everywhere. So that is an, a challenging issue. You have to deal with this thing carefully as a profession as a whole. Over. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Shainur Alam, you want to say something? Uh, no, okay, okay, uh, Professor Mejan. Uh, uh, our uh, uh, Dr. Nitish Devdar, sir, already answered these questions. Uh, we have no paravet in our grid level. They are, uh, we call it quark. So okay. they are the main problems uh, for management of daily health in, in our country. Uh, already answered these questions. So over. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mansoor, Dr. Zahir Mansoor, do you want to say something at this stage? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Mizan, and thank you, Dr. Hakan, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, well, I have to agree because um, there will be some degree of um, difference in terms of uh, dairy production in different countries. Um, I'm aware that in Sweden or in any European countries, you would have like a modern dairy production with the automatic milking system, etc. So I would I would I would uh, assume uh, that the level of awareness between the vets as well as the fam uh, the farmers would be uh, would be good would be great in terms of the use of antibiotics, uh, but. Um, yeah. Uh, other than that, how would you convince the the dairy farmers, um, you know, uh, in terms of uh, a good and responsible use of antibiotics? Uh, because I think that would be another important factor to be taken into into consideration uh, when you talk about convincing the farmers or even vets. Because this is what is happening here in Malaysia, you know, because. Um, 
um, in terms of the law enforcement, in terms of the the, the use of antibiotics themselves, the vet, the, the, the even the farmers, they they have the excess of the antibiotics, mm. and they are using it, you know, and, and not under the uh, the directions of the vets. So. I I understand the problem. Thank you for your remark. Uh, I think it's uh, it has some uh, uh, work to do. You have some work to do uh, in in such an occasion because uh, it's easy in uh, in our country where you cannot buy or you cannot get uh, antibiotics uh, unless the veterinarian prescribes it, and the veterinarians are very agreed upon each other uh, doing the right thing and we had for uh, i would say the last 20 years have we have had several workshops with farmers and veterinarians together and discussing what they shouldn't do and, and i remember especially one time i was in the south of sweden and we're talking about macrolides and i like them not to use it because uh, they used it a lot and then I was phoned up by my colleague who was very angry because I had made him uh, look uh, silly because he used it all of the time. But the farmers who he heard these uh, lectures, they, they were convinced that it was something true they heard. So you must have open workshops with all the parties, uh, all the actors, uh, to get this to be the common sense and suddenly it was the common sense and then it uh, it moved extremely quick uh, i i know um, it's also good in sweden because the the veterinarians cannot earn any money from selling antibiotics they must sell it to the list price do you understand they cannot take an extra they must sell it to the list price so they, they don't use it because they earn any money they use it because they need it for the animal i think that's also very uh, important not earning money from selling antibiotics because if you if you do that you will sell as much as you can uh, some people will do that and that's uh, you cannot uh, it will be like that but it's legislation then uh, and that's not always popular. <laughs> so, so we're happy that it, it is like that. Okay, thank you, Arkan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Abdul Samad, sir, do you want to say anything about the using antibiotics by the para vets? What is the situation in India? Okay. Uh, well, it's a, it, it, it's a good presentation, uh, you know, we have just listened to. Now, somebody mentioned about uh, irrational use of antibiotics by parrots. I think this, you know, this is true. But I can tell you that even vets use antibiotics irrationally. Yeah, yeah. And this, even vets use irrationally, and that we should accept. Every time discussion takes place, we throw the blame on the parrots alone. <clears throat> I have got mm -hmm. around 800,000 animals recorded on my system along with every treatment that is done. And I find, I mean, just three days back, you know, for this presentation, I analyzed the data for diseases and the kind of treatment that is given. I'm talking of evidence-based. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about hearsay. You know, I've got a solid, you know, data with me. It suggests that like, uh, it was mentioned in the presentation, presentation 80% of the treatment is for mastitis. Okay, the antibiotic use in around, and I've got around, uh, I think, 130,000 treatment records I have analyzed for one year. And it says that 80% of the treatment which has been done with antibiotic is for mastitis, clinical mastitis and chronic mm -hmm. mastitis. So if you are able to control uh, mastitis, you know, your use of drug will go down drastically. Another thing, uh, you know, farmer is using, you know, antibiotic because the animal needs, you know, the un unless the doctor tells him or unless that is an anecdotal, you know, experience 
that you know if this happens then if i use antibiotic the you know animal will get right the basic the basic problem you know which uh, which we have encountered in india is that uh, you know there is there is no uh, i mean protocol for using drug in case of mastitis so while analyzing i have found that there are people who are using gentamicin about 25% there are people who are using chloramphenicol another 30 32% there are people who are using uh, you know prednisolone very extensively anti inflammatory very extens extensively combining with antibiotic and you know whole a lot of antibiotics nobody you know i have i did not find a single person using penicillin or tetracycline for treating mastitis so this is something you know we'll have to we will have to look at uh, you know can we develop a kind of you know protocol and we have worked in you know one of the areas in 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 uh, you know western maharashtra you know the province uh, i come from and we found that you know it was the environmental mastitis you know which was more common and uh, we found that the main reason was tie bar the animals were tied with a small leash and then they would defecate and urinate and sit on that yeah. that was the main reason second thing is cement concrete floor now in europe and in you know, north america they have cement concrete flooring but they put bedding on it to keep it dry we don't use bedding at all i mean you know in india i have never found in a farm using you know dry grass as bedding you know it's just on naked cement concrete floor and therefore they have to wash the floor twice a day they have to wash the animal twice a day so it's all humid environment and then you have birds nest small you know areas where you have you know dung and urine along with water animal will sit over it because we are feeding animal at the time of milking and therefore when they go out after milking they immediately lie down because we are not offering any feed to them so they should stand you know at least for just like said you know 30 minutes or 45 minutes so usually they are busy feeding that's why they don't sit so what we did in that uh, you know area was you know we encourage people to come up with a housing system which is compact earthen floor earth floor without cement concrete but it is well laid and well drained so that urine and dung will be dry and then at least two third area should be open to sky because we have lots of sun here so it's always dry and then you have a small area for them to rest if they want under the shed and we find 95% of the animal will not like to go inside the shed they will like to be you know outside the shed open that by itself has reduced number and case of mastitis to a great extent there are farm farmers who told me that they started this you know, for one year or two years and they have not had a case of acute mastitis after that so i think there are similar interventions you know which are uh, which would reduce uh, you know the transmission and reduce the uh, you know cases of mastitis that's what okay thank you very much sir thank you sir we have a question i i am to draw the attention of mr sajid rahman sir I will ask just a part of the question, not the whole, because I think other is very difficult for because <clears throat> the according to the cell culture, in the culture sensitive test in our country, but from the mastitis sample, most of the penicillin were resist found resistant. So my question is to you: How we can improve the situation, sir? And there's a classical way actually. Whenever there is a resistance, we, we must find out an antimicrobial which is still effective against these microbes. And this, there is a there is a kind of shifting. You shift to the that micro antimicrobial, stay continue that antimicrobial for a for one year or more. Then you will find that the sensitivity pattern will again come over. So that's that is the revival of the sensitivity. That is the common strategy that we can apply for this purpose. Usually, that depends on the nature of the microbes as well as the depending on the nature of the antimicrobial. So I'm not sure that which microbes is usually causing mast mastitis for this purpose. Oh, if if it is, uh, but in general, uh, the penicillin sensitivity that is revival is possible. 
So they can try for a, a effective antimicrobial for six months to one year. Usually that period is sufficient to get the uh, re revival of the sensitivity again. So that can be an option. Just find an effective antimicrobial, use that for one year and continue sensitivity testing for through, throughout the year. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. So how come, should we continue? Uh, uh, I can comment a little bit oh. about uh, sensitivity. Uh, what did we do since we had about 10% uh, resistant Staphorus uh, 30 years ago? Uh, we stopped treating the chronic cases. We agreed on not to try to treat the chronic cases uh, with cloxacillin or something because th this only selected more resistant strains. So, but it took some time, a decade or so, because before it was agreed by colleagues and uh, even uh, uh, the university, but uh, since then we, we didn't use cloxa or, or erythromycin or something on these cases, uh, the resistant resistance started to go away. And that is all the Nordic countries has done the same thing the last 20 years. They banned uh, erythromycin and uh, cloxacillin on, on the chronic Staphorus cases. And all the countries have very low uh, frequency of uh, resistant strains today. Yeah, yes, I, I'm not sure it can be done at your place, but it's how we did it in Sweden. I had, in fact, one farm with Staphorus problems. It had about 50% uh, resistant, resistant cases. So, but they used cloxacillin for many years as um, dry cow therapy. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what this means to, to us or you, but they have no problem these days since they stopped treating the chronic cases and uh, they have 700 cows, 120,000 in the bulk tank, and 13 tons of milk. And an own, uh, um, they produce their own cheese. So, but they tried with the antibiotics and it didn't work. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's just, it's just, it's a big herd, but it's also a classic uh, success. Uh, for the antibiotic control and, and the health work. Okay, okay. I, I will go, shall I move on then? Yes, the rest of the rest part of the presentation. Okay, next one is um, more hands-on, the drying off the milking cow. I guess you all know there are two times uh, during a cow's life uh, every year where there is more new infection i mean s cell reactions in the other one is after calving as you can see to the left here the red uh, arrow and one is a dry off the other red arrow to the right so i think uh, the worst uh, is uh, after calving where the cow is very sensitive to, to other infection. But you can control uh, what's happening at the drying off uh, via a, a good dry off procedure. So we discussed this a lot in Sweden, uh, and this time we will discuss a little bit how should we dry off a cow. And I'm talking about Swedish cows, which are high producing and merely do not dry off uh, spontaneously. You must do something to get them to dry. This is the table, I think most of you might have seen it, uh, which is done out of uh, a Swedish uh, scientific study uh, where we had problems uh, with, um, they didn't dry off the high producing cows. It was Martin Odenstein who did this 2006 and, and he uh, checked out to make uh, 36 to 48 hours um, 
milking into wool when you dried off the cow. And three different groups, otherwise uh, one below 15 kilos per day, one between 15 and 25 kilos a day, and one above 25 kilos a day. And you can see that all these three groups were during this study uh, dried off the same way. Uh, 36 hours the first time, 30, uh, 48 hours the second time, and 48 hours the third time if you had over 25 kilos. And also some uh, recommendations uh, corresponding to this uh, table. Check other and he health, teat dip, day 1 to 7, day 8, teat dip, day 9 to 14, check other and health and teat dip, because this is a, a hazardous time when the other goes from lactating, fully lactating, to dried off. Uh, you must pass that period quick enough. Uh, it was our uh, feeling. And with this uh, scheme, you can do it on a regular working week on every cow. Uh, sometimes one cow or another will have uh, one other uh, further 48 hours uh, relapse and milking once again. We also try to use dry cow treatment on uh, hopeful cases, I mean mild subclinical cases, not chronic, uh, um, not promising cases with Staphorus, they will not heal. So we use other health class, uh, uh, which is uh, really um, a geometric mean for the last three test days uh, that gives them uh, a classing. So. Um, here you see selective dry cow treatment is believed to be the best way and it's uh, today it's all also agreed in the US which took some time which uh, they have used uh, blanket dry cow therapy in a five point program as you might well know and here you can see the other health class which is called JHKL uh, is from zero to nine and uh, you, it corresponds to a certain cell count, the last three test milkings. Um, and you can see, should you use antibiotics on these healthy cows, no dry cow treatment. On these cows, from other health class, uh, three to eight, you could use it if you think it is worth it because of the cow's uh, history. And on these worst cows, who are above 600,000, you shouldn't use uh, dry cow treatment because they will not heal anyway. You only create a certain risk of more resistant strains. So this was the, this is how we used it uh, for several years. It also has a column for teat sealants, uh, which we are not so fond of. Um, if we not have very uh, environmentally loaded farms, which have a lot of envi environmental mastitis. And that is not so common in Sweden uh, yet. We still have most, most Staphorus and uh, uh, contagious strep uh, Streptis galactia and Strep hubris uh, of the, is more abundant. But of course, uh, you might not have a, a cell count test. So therefore, in our new guidelines, we also have a table for CMT tests. You don't know the cell count. You could do repeatedly two CMT tests, one two weeks before drying off, and one at the last milking day before you dry off the cow. You can see it's the same principle you get CMT 1 to 5 and you move to the columns for what you should do. And of course, check the cow and see if it's uh, worthwhile or if maybe you shouldn't uh, be too hard on the dry cow treatment. It's a bit tricky because CMT you have on one quarter and you might 
think uh, that it's sell, uh, rare that you have the same CMT on all four quarters, but you have to use this with some feeling, uh, some uh, documentation. Uh, it's easy if all are one uh, or all are five. Um, so that's how it looks uh, in these recommendations. And the dry cow treatment in the Nordic countries, uh, which have, which uh, Sweden belongs to, they have a collaboration between this. And you can see that Sweden is here. It's 26.6% of the cows that get the dry cow treat treatment. And uh, Denmark is using it a lot. Uh, and Finland and Norway much less, especially in Norway, they don't like dry cow treatment. But in all multivariant regression analysis that, that are performed, the two risk factors, the, the two, uh, sorry, the two success factors that are most evident in most studies, in almost all studies, are dry cow treatment and teat dipping after milking. So uh, we try to use it. Uh, we are on the right angle, uh, right uh, level uh, corresponding to the population in Sweden. But it might be that it's not the right cow any, uh, all of the time. Some maybe use it on all and some on none. So the, me the median is okay, but it might be the wrong animal as well. So we try to do some communication about this to the farmers right now this year. and. Uh, Uh, communicating these new guidelines m much more uh, clear. I also have something uh, that I can share with you. Uh, uh, this uh, how to gi give a cow an intramammary antibiotic treatment. There is a good um, uh, the link up on this slide, uh, it's open. It's a Canadian uh, link. They have done some uh, some leaflets you can uh, give to your farmers or use yourself. Uh, here it says how to admi administrate an intermammary treatment. Uh, it both uh, for mastitis and uh, for dry cow. Uh, there are some uh, details here uh, and pictures. It's free to load down from the internet. Quite nice uh, produced. The same uh, the same um, place in Canada uh, has also produced how to give a cow an antibiotic injection. This could also be good if you'd like to teach your farmers to treat animals with uh, searing um, also freely downloaded downloaded from the internet and uh, at the last one is how to give a cow an internal teat seal um, both for um, uh, intramammary treatment and teat sealant it's important you don't protrude uh, the tube too long into the T channel. So we'll get these links and you can use them if you like. Okay, I will now move to the last item of today, which I shall present, the other health pyramids. And uh, my question is, uh, I think they are long-lasting buildings. If you do the right thing long enough, you will get the expected result. So, and I really appreciated uh, the description of, of the, cont uh, the contaminated floor when the cow lies down and gets dirty. Yeah, that will give you strepubris mastitis, of course. Uh, that's uh, quite simple. Uh, the other health pyramids is also open accessed on the internet. 
It's a Swedish uh, version. is interactive where you just click and and you get uh, uh, some underlying uh, uh, papers, but in English uh, and nine other languages, it's a PDF like a small book. You can see to the right uh, the first uh, uh, page. You can see there is one other health pyramid for contagious other bacteria page 3, and one for environmental other bacteria, page 20, and one for robot milking, page 37. So you just uh, go on this uh, link and you can see it uh, and travel around in it. Just exa an example of the pyramid, how it's working. Uh, you have this other health pyramid with bricks here. The basics for preventing contagious mastitis, teeth infection, biosecurity, calving, milking routines, and milk machine function, function, and so on. The thought is build the base and secure each brick and then move on to a higher level. So there are four levels really, uh, 16. Uh, different bricks here for contagious bacteria. And if you s click on the on the Swedish one, you just click on the brick and you get this, uh, like this page. Uh, action area one. How to succeed? Use a TTIP. There are six different recommendations. How to succeed? And there are four, don't do that, common mistakes. And there is also a small table lost down to the, to the paper that says, how can you test if it's okay? Can I just check uh, something? It's about uh, storage of the TTIP function check. If you check it in a robot, for example, never alert. Target is this, okay, mm, but if you are here, you should be better on that one. So the next one, biosecurity at carving in the same way. Do like this, don't do this, check if you're good enough with this uh, target, okay, and alert. You must be better. Just as a, an example, the last one. <clears throat> if you load down the PDF, you can just scroll in the document. You will see all these uh, like pages, and you can uh, you can copy them and send them to a farm, or you can even write them out and give them to a farm if you like. And they are in many languages. Uh, unfortunately, not the nation language. Just English and several uh, Polish and Russian and so on. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's it has been a great uh, uh, time for me to talk for you, and uh, I'm happy to uh, let my. Swedish red cow uh, look in the sky and uh, think about is it she's evident uh, she knows you cannot al always do everything perfect but the promising thing for her and for you is that when it's health work it might be enough to do one thing a little bit better every day further on and you will get a better result so the health work is stable if you just stick to it and don't let it go away so with that slide i like to thank you for listening and i give you some of some of you have seen it before uh, it's my special uh, resting place at the mountain in uh, in the middle of sweden in the winter time me and my German Shepherd uh, go up on about 1,000 meters above the sea 
and we look to the south and we get some thoughts that might be promising in for your life okay okay thank questions you very much. yeah thank you very much Hakan. so i think i we can go for comments i think we i should start from the dr shahini ralam he's here yes okay uh, thank you yeah, thank uh, dr Hakan, for your nice and happy presentation i have learned a lot from your presentation uh, i have seen the remarkable findings from your presentations the swedish cow you have mentioned that only 150,000 somatic cell count this is very much remarkable but in our country uh, in field uh, levels we have not enough facilities for somatic cell count and uh, uh, previously our professor Ditish Devnath sir already mentioned our uh, another problems are the village doctors or coax there uh, when a cows got mastitis they first call the coax they have started uh, medicine uh, by their own choice they uh, sometimes they are using penicillins sometimes they are using zentamicin and um, are both or combined they are using such type of medicine this is our very challenging uh, in our country uh, in our country so uh, i think uh, in your presentation you have also mentioned you have uh, in your country you haven't faced any e coli mastitis or clefsial mastitis um, uh, and uh, you uh, i have also seen another findings the teeth dipping teeth dipping uh, for dry cow management is very good initiative for controlling this subclinical mastitis. So, have you any uh, guidelines for teeth dipping in your country? Yeah, teeth dipping is uh, is within the uh, other health pyramid, quite quite uh, in the beginning of, of uh, yeah. Uh, it's very uh, effective. Uh, but you must do it directly after, immediately after you uh, remove the cluster, or your. Then it's uh, yeah, you you can really protect, uh, and we use a lot of iodine tea tipping in Sweden, yeah, yeah. although we don't think it's always by the book the right thing, but uh, it seems to be one of the best ones. Unless we have a lot of step hubris, then we use uh, something that, which is more um, care, caring for the skin. Because then you have uh, the cow lice in some area and, and uh, in the cubicles, for, for instance, or, or in the straw bed, there might be a lot of strep hubris uh, to infect the other. It, it's sad to hear you use gentamicin and, and uh, so on because I think it's it, it's it, it will not work. Uh, it would just it will just select more resistant strains. The, it's uh, almost impossible uh, to come further if you use it. And that was as I told you about this big farm. Uh, which really tried to, to treat away the staphorus, they didn't succeed. They also tried to vaccinate, they, they didn't succeed. But when they went for hygiene and biosecurity, they suddenly succeeded. So, but it's uh, it's hard to to reach it. You must be extremely. Uh, uh, <laughs> You must thank really you. work. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Akhan. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yes, uh, Dr. Shahinur Alam, I have a specific question especially for you. Because, you know, Hakan was emphasizing on this presentation because in Bangladesh, we are not, the farmers are not very familiar or aware about the dry cow management. And in Bangladesh, we don't have any dry cow product if there is infection in the dry period. And so far, I know, the DLS has approved to import the dry cow product from uh, overseas because in Bangladesh we don't have any dry cow product. And if you want to 
bring down the mastitis rate in dairy heart you must you, you must treat the infected animals in the dry period there is no other way the infected animal should be treated but the, the farmers the farmers are always uh, talking about it and pressing about it we don't have any dry product so what should the dls should do to get the final approval to have the dry dry cup product in bangladesh so what is what do you want to say what is your comment about this uh, 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 professor mizan uh, i i, I please again your question please okay because you know we don't in bangladesh we yes, don't please, have any please. in bangladesh we don't have any dry cow product yes yes, yes. and dls has approved it but it didn't get the approval from dz drug so yeah. how you can faster how can make is faster the process Okay, okay, okay. One pharmaceutical company, and I think the farmers are waiting for the long time. Professor Samad Sari is here. He knows yes. because the dry cow is uh, product is very, very important. If you have an infected cow in the dry period, it should be treated. But okay. even in Bangladesh, we don't have the permission to import it. <clears throat> yes, uh, well, you have uh, uh, mentioned a nice question for me uh, because you know. We have only uh, drug regulation authority in our country, only DZDA uh, uh, approval authority for the antibiotics and uh, drugs. And uh, first, the, uh, the farmers or importers uh, should need a license from DZDA. If they go to the license, then DZDA uh, livestock, uh, the livestock services uh, 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 issues a NOC to this DLS for importing such type of medicine from the importing importers countries. So uh, every month uh, we have issued a lot of NOCs for this type of uh, medicines, but yet we have not uh, get any uh, medicines such type of medicine dry cow uh, dry cow uh, uh, products in our country so if dzda and dls dzda uh, uh, if anybody wants to import this type of medicine of course the dls will get initiative quickly to import such type of medicine okay thank you very much thank you i think the people should uh, contact with you because the, it should be approved it should be approved because this the otherwise otherwise we cannot because we have a very yes. high rate of mastitis in bangladesh yes. otherwise we cannot we cannot bring it down so thank you very much i think uh, next i'll go to the rozaihan mansoor uh, please uh, make your uh, comments very shortly if you want to by this time you have already talked but if you want to make any comments you can do that now okay thank please. you Dr. Minzan. Uh, and also thank you for inviting me to join in for uh, tonight's um, forum uh, it was a very interesting discussion uh, whereby different countries can give uh, different opinions. Um, it's just that I think um, at the end of it, you know, uh, a prudent use of antibiotics is very important because in veterinary medicine, we are always, uh, I'm not saying that we are the victims, but uh, in a way we, we, we could be contributing to the development of AMR. Uh, in human medicine because of the use of antibiotics, the use of critically important antibiotics in uh, in animals and everything. So I guess it's very important for us to be together. Um, um, vets uh, should play a very big and important role in educating the farmers uh, in terms of the judicious and uh, prudent use of antibiotics uh, in order for us to curb the, uh, the, the this global problem of AMR. Thank you, Dr. Mizan. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Rodahan. So now I have to move to Professor Sajid Raman, sir. Sir, I think it is difficult for you to digest all the things because there are many no, things. You are very much unfamiliar with this yes. because you are from uh, human medicine. So maybe uh, we, you have a topic to talk or if you have some uh, special comments, no, your topic is how to, how antimicrobial use in dairy animals impact on 
human health and ways to control it in Bangladesh. Because you know, oh, in Bangladesh, we have we have, don't have conflict. Yes. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's an enlightening session for me, though it was really difficult for me to digest or understand a lot of things. But the basic spirit of the presentation, what I perceive is actually, that is how antimicrobials are being used in animal, particularly in dairy cattle. And how, what is the link? That is, all of us know about this link between the use of antimicrobial in any of the sector and the uh, final impact on human health. So, in in the context of Bangladesh, as you were we were talking about, is uh, there is a, we have identified a couple of antimicrobials. That is around 22 medicine antimicrobials, which are commonly used for both human and human health and in animal health. And uh, uh, Dr. Shainul was mentioning about that DGDA is the common controlling authority and we are trying to uh, uh, minimize the list. That is the lowest number of antimicrobial should remain in the market as a common use for both human and animal. So uh, as a beginning, possibly we have already in, uh, revoked uh, polystine for almost all formulation except one. And we are moving forwards in order to withdraw some of the antimicrobial from the market. But the point is, we need to establish uh, actually an ecosystem, at a surveillance system that includes all of the areas. Then now we have, it's a, say for instance, for sensitivity laboratory, we have a culture sensitivity laboratory in the hospitals or in medical colleges. You also have some laboratories, but there's no bridging, there's no share of information. So we'll expect that in Bangladesh, we'll have a common platform that is where we will share our information. That is both the consumption information as well as the sensitivity information. And we can actually, a team should work together as a uh, professor from India, he was talking about is that is the One Health approach and Professor Nidhi sir here in Bangladesh is a champion of One Health. So we will expect that uh, this spirit of One Health will be reflected because the most necessity of the One Health spirit is on in order to contain antimicrobial resistance. That is the point of convergence. So we will greatly appreciate if there is a surveillance system established incorporating human health, animal health and environment and that will include both consumption and sensitivity patterns so that we can interpret and we can intervene. Thanks a lot for the, to the organizers. That is Outer Health Bangladesh, particularly Professor Mizan. Thank you very much for allowing me and giving me the opportunity to learn from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. So, sir, uh, now I uh, want to go back to Nitish, sir, if you want to say something. Yes. Sir, already talked to us. Yeah, I think I have talked quite a lot. I don't want to go further, but certainly it was a so enlightening discussion. I learned quite a lot, and I also echo uh, with uh, Professor Saeed Rahman there in Bangladesh. And I think it is a global call now, uh, therefore, uh, controlling or containment of antimicrobial resistance. We need to work together uh, as a One Health concept. And we have been trying to practice this thing. And also data from different sources would come at one point so that we can have an access to that and so that we can rationally use, responsibly use antibiotics. And those days are coming. We have been trying to integrate the surveillance of human health, animal health, and aquaculture. This is one uh, you know, initiative is ongoing, and we will uh, you know, uh, develop a sort of dashboard, a common dashboard, one health dashboard for antimicrobial sensitivity uh, data uh, under the surveillance program that we are going to take. So with this word, I thanks to the organizer and I also congratulate to the speaker. He has really given a very new insights to our professional colleagues, those who are listening to that. And I also believe there are some farmers in this discussion, and I hope that they will be also enlightened by that discussion. Thank you very much again for inviting me and for having this important discussion. This is a very important area, and it is the right time to have that discussion. Thank you, Mizan. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So now I move to Professor Abdul Samad, sir. So, sir, please uh, make your uh, remarks. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Mizan. I'd, I'd just like to add, uh, you know, one one piece of information. Uh, I think uh, I had discussed this with Dr. Mizan earlier. See, uh, last year we filed a patent uh, 
in India as well as international patent. Uh, because you know we have we have gone through the literature which says that if you use germicide, it has a lot of effects even on good microbiota. For example, if you use antibiotic and germicide on the skin, you know, the skin microbiota changes. You know, then intramammary, the mammary canal, you know, by microbiota will change. So we have developed a technology, we call it reinforced physical barrier. Now, these are uh, dual polymers, uh, which we when apply, uh, form a very continuous film with a pore size, which is less than 0.2 micron. And it's quite flexible because, uh, you know, it also contains uh, an amount of moisture. Now, what happens, you know, when you when you when you apply it, uh, you know, like a teeth dip, it forms a film on the teeth orifice, and which will remain for say, you know, another twelve hours or so, and bacteria cannot enter. So we don't use any antibacterial or any antibiotic in it. Same has been adopted, uh, you know, as a teeth sealant, where it forms a firm seal, and doesn't allow entry of bacteria. So what we are doing is we are trying to put a barrier of entry of bacteria into the body at the gate from where it will enter. And this uh, has been licensed to one company uh, for EU countries in Belgium. Uh, they have got manufacturing facilities in France. And uh, I was talking to Dr. Mizan that if there is a company in Bangladesh interested in the technology, we can talk to them so that you, know, you can have a facility created over there. It's, it's a technology which has got a lot of applications, including wound. So you just spray on the wound. Don't use any antibiotic, it, it will get healed because it is forming a barrier and it doesn't allow contamination of your wound you know, with environmental bacteria. So I think you know slowly we need to move out uh, from antibiotic to use other technologies which are uh, not germicidal so that we don't disturb the good bacteria which are there on the skin and other parts of the body. Thank you very much. It was very interesting discussion. Uh, and uh, of course, I have learned a lot you know, from this discussion. Um, and Dr. Mizan, I think you know you are bringing a lot of you know stakeholders and uh, experts together. And uh, certainly, we will be able to learn from each other a lot. Thank you very much you know, once again. And I congratulate the speaker for the excellent talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have uh, a, the program has gone for uh, two hours now. So everybody should be tired by this time. So thank you. I want to thank uh, Hakkan uh, at first because uh, you all thought to speak for a long time and you are working on the slides uh, quite a long time. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Professor Saidur Raman, sir. I think it is not easy for you to wait for uh, two hours here because it is not so much relevant, all the parts, because there are so many new things for you. And also, Nitish sir, I'm sorry you are so much busy, and you always uh, just uh, come to talk with us when you have time, and you don't say no. And Professor Abdul Samad sir, because he is also busy, but uh, when I have, whenever I invited him for a talk or for a discussion, he's always ready to contribute. Thank you very much, sir. And also Ruzayan Mansur from uh, Malaysia. It is, uh, I think it is a uh, sleeping time for you. It is a midnight. Thank you very much to be with us. And also Shaini Alam. Thank you very much. So I think we will go now offline. Thank you very much for a nice discussion. And uh,